different countries. And uh, as per our conversation with the ITC of UPLB, our registrants have reached about 560. So that's why they are extending the webinar on YouTube live streaming po. And so the Kapisanang Kimika ng Pilipinas Southern Tagalog uh, is an organization that was established in 1971 as the Kapisana ng mga Kimiko ng Pilipinas or Chemical Society of the Philippines, Los Baños Chapter, by a core group of chemistry professionals from the University of the Philippines, Los Baños. The organization later expanded to establish scientific linkages in the Southern Tagalog region, hence its present name. The organization became formally registered as a non-stock and non-profit association with the Securities and Exchange Commission on January 26, 2016. As the current president of KKPSD Incorporated, it is my duty, together with the members of the board of directors, to see to it that the organization is still able to fulfill its mandates of promoting the advancement of chemical science and technology and taking an active role in the dissemination of knowledge in chemistry and its allied fields, despite our physical limitations during these challenging times. We are very fortunate to have with us today our speaker, who is a distinguished chemist in our country, to share to us his studies on the potential of coconut oil and its derivatives as antiviral agents against the novel coronavirus. The topic is very timely because as we all know, the COVID-19 pandemic has greatly affected all of us in many aspects. Thus, the quest for cure for the disease is really something that many scientists all over the world are immersing into. So let me formally introduce to you our guest speaker for this morning. Dr. Fabian M. Dairit is Professor Emeritus at the Department of Chemistry at Ateneo de Manila University. He obtained his BS Chemistry degree at the Ateneo in 1975 and his MA and PhD degrees in Chemistry from Princeton University in 1978 and 1981, respectively. He was a postdoctoral research associate at Oxford University from 1980 to 1982, University of Tokyo in 1993, and University of Minnesota in 1994. He was admitted as an academician to the National Academy of Science and Technology Philippines in 2009 and is currently its vice president. He is also president of the Integrated Chemists of the Philippines. In 2016, he was appointed chair of the Scientific Advisory Committee for Health of the Asian and Pacific Co Coconut Community, or APCC, now expanded to the International Coconut Community, or ICC. He has published research papers on coconut oil in various research journals. In 2013, he wrote a popular book, Coconut Oil from Diet to Therapy, and has written numerous articles and given talks on the benefits of coconut oil. He continues to conduct research to improve the quality of virgin coconut oil. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest speaker for this morning, Emeritus Professor and NAS Academician Fabian Dairit. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, good morning to everyone. Um, special greetings, of course, to the members of the KKP uh, Southern Tagalog chapter. Uh, to your president, of course, Joseph, as well as to um, Dr. Vicky Vigo, your um, board member. Um, and of course, also greetings to our uh, members of the Integrated Chemists of the Philippines who are watching this presentation. I'm honored and pleased to be invited to talk to you about coconut oil as one of the possible measures against uh, this novel coronavirus. While coconut oil might not strike you as a high-tech cure like drugs and vaccines, I hope that this talk will convince you of the power of simple solutions with the science to back it up. 
This presentation is not meant to diminish the need for the development of vaccines or other effective cures. At the very least, I hope to convince you that coconut oil can be an effective nutritional supplement, especially during the next few months when vaccines will still not be available. So how did this all um, begin? Um, as early as mid-January uh, 2020, uh, it was becoming clear that this novel coronavirus, which was breaking out in Wuhan, China, was a very dangerous virus. It was still called 2019-MCOV at that time. It is well known that coconut oil has antibacterial properties, but its antiviral properties were not as well known. I discussed this with Dr. Mary Newport, an American pediatrician, who is involved with research on Alzheimer's disease and coconut oil. And we decided to write the review of the antiviral properties of coconut oil and as well as virgin coconut oil. On January 31, we co-authored a review of the scientific literature on the potential of coconut oil and its derivatives as effective and safe uh, agents against the novel coronavirus. We posted this article on social media as well as on the Ateneo University website where it attracted a lot of attention. At that time, there was no drug against this novel uh, coronavirus, and today there's still no drug against this virus. Fortunately, the uh, Philippine Council for Health Research and Development of the Department of Science and Technology saw enough merit in this hypothesis to fund an in vitro study together with uh, Dr. Irvin Enriquez and Dr. Uh, Chris Lopez, and I shall describe this briefly in this presentation. So here's my outline. First, I will start with the virus itself, uh, SARS-CoV-2. Then I will describe coconut oil and its antiviral as well as some antibacterial uh, compounds. Uh, third, uh, third section is the uh, meat of the presentation where I will present the evidence for the use of BCO against uh, COVID-19. And finally, I will talk about how we might be able to survive COVID-19 with our coconuts. So on to the first topic. Uh, although everyone probably already has some background knowledge on this novel coronavirus since it's always the news every day, I would just like to point out a few things. Uh, SARS, or Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2, which is formerly called uh, 2019-NCOV, is a strain of coronavirus that causes COVID-19, which is the disease. And uh, the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a pandemic on March 11, 2020. Sorry. There have been three recent coronavirus epidemics. Uh, SARS-CoV, which is uh, 2002. Uh, MERS-CoV, that's a Middle East Respiratory Syndrome in 2012. And then the SARS-CoV-2, uh, 2019. So of course, the question is, might there be another uh, recurrence of another SARS uh, version in the future. Uh, the figures on the right show the electron microscope images of uh, SARS-CoV. That's the first, first SARS-CoV. Uh, but SARS-CoV-2 behaves uh, similarly. So here you can see the size of the, um, the virus. It's uh, around you know, 100 uh, nanometers. And uh, the bottom image is, is how the uh, virus uh, looks like when it's invading the, uh, the cell. Now, just a few things about um, this virus. So it measures from 80 to 120 nanometers in diameter. So it's a nanoparticle. It has four structural proteins. Uh, S is a spike protein. E is an envelope protein. M is a membrane protein, and N is a nucleocapsid um, it wraps around the uh, RNA. The S, E, and M proteins are located on the viral envelope, so that on the outside, and the N protein holds the RNA genome inside. The S protein enables the virus to attach to ACE2 receptors on the membrane of the body's host cells. Importantly, the S protein of SARS-CoV-2 has a polybasic cleavage site, which is believed to enhance the cell-cell fusion and pathogenicity of this virus. 
Now the ACE2 receptors are present in a wide variety of human cells. And this reveals the potential risk of COVID-19 because those are the sites where the virus will attach. Uh, the spike proteins on the surface of the coronavirus bind to cell receptors called ACE2 uh, that, that are found in many places in the human body. SARS-CoV-2 appears to have evolved more effective spike proteins for binding the ACE2 receptor. Uh, this may be the reason why this virus is able to affect more infection sites. While it is still considered as a respiratory disease, COVID-19 has become more than a respiratory disease. So here's an overview of the treatment strategies. Uh, the typical strategies for fighting uh, viruses are to target its proteins or its genetic material, so RNA or DNA, uh, using drugs and vaccines. The science behind this is very sophisticated and drugs and vaccines are designed to be very specific. So this approach is very expensive. However, one can also target the lipid membrane. SARS-CoV-2 belongs to the beta coronavirus class, which can be effectively inactivated by lipid solvents. The virus membrane is derived from the host cell. One major advantage of targeting the membrane is that it does not undergo mutation in the same way that the RNA and proteins do. So the membrane is not likely to, yet. so the membrane is really somewhat a better target. I do not know why this has not been given as much attention. So let's look at coconut and its antiviral compounds. Some quick facts about coconut oil. The coconut has been consumed by people in the tropics for millennia. It is the basis of many of today's prominent culinary traditions. Uh, you know, you have curries and all um, kata in the Philippines. And uh, the Pacific Islands would, have, would not have been inhabited if there's no uh, coconut. The fresh coconut meat contains about 35% coconut oil. Uh, virgin coconut oil, or VCO, is obtained directly from fresh coconut meat without chemical processing, and VCO is grass. Uh, grass means generally recognized as safe. Uh, VCO is a long, has a long tradition of medicinal use, and it's considered as a functional food. Objections to coconut oil come mainly from the West, where it is hardly consumed, and there is no evidence that coconut oil causes heart disease. Uh, this is the uh, fatty acid profile of coconut oil. Uh, coconut oil really is a unique fatty acid composition. Uh, sui generis really means uh, in a class of its own uh, because there's really no commonly consumed uh, vegetable oil that is this um, fatty acid composition. Uh, and what makes uh, coconut unique is that it is a high lauric acid content, which is uh, 48%, uh, which goes from about 45 to 53% uh, uh, lauric acid, and uh, which no other commonly consumed uh, vegetable oil, oil has. Uh, the fatty acids in asterisk are the ones which have been reported to have um, in vitro antiviral activity. So capric acid, lauric acid, and as well as oleic acid have been reported in some um, articles to have antiviral properties. Now the fatty acids are present in the um, vegetable oil as a mixture of triglycerides. So those are three typical structures of triglycerides and um, what's well, uh, many combinations of uh, triglycerides which are present in um, coconut oil or actually all vegetable oils. So uh, <clears throat> lipase enzyme. So the question is, how does coconut oil become antiviral? Well, the uh, Triglycerides themselves are not antiviral, but um, when coconut oil is uh, consumed, there's lipase enzyme present in many parts of the body, such as saliva, skin, digestive system, uh, liver, blood vessels, and so forth. Um, and so the, the coconut oil that is ingested are uh, hydrolyzed by the lipase enzymes. So on the, le on the left, 
you see a typical uh, triglyceride, trilaurin, um, lipase will act on it. So you remove one lauric acid and then lipase will act on the intermediate again and get, you get monolaurin and then another lauric acid and then and so forth. So from one molecule of trilaurin, you can get uh, one molecule of monolaurin and up to three molecules of uh, lauric acid. Now the enzyme products of interest are monolaurin lark, and lauric acid. And there are, as I said, there are three equivalents of this. Coconut oil becomes antibacterial and antiviral after in vivo hydrolysis with lipase enzyme. The bacterial and antiviral compounds in include monolaurin, lauric acid, monocaprin from uh, C10, uh, capric acid. So there's a, a wide spectrum of activity that you would get if um, when coconut oil is uh, hydrolyzed. And of course, um, 45 uh, to 53% of coconut oil is uh, lauric acid. Now here's a very interesting um, feature of um, the uh, <coughs> lauric ester derivatives. Uh, although this set of slides will deal mainly with antibacterial properties, um, it shows the uh, the interesting feature of these compounds. So the antimicrobial lauryl ester derivatives are what I call uh, designed by nature. So there's a natural double action antimicrobial um, property. The lauryl ester derivatives, which are on the left column, are all antimicrobial, uh, except for um, DDG, which is synthetic. Um, now they uh, undergo, the esters undergo um, hydrolysis by lipase to release lauric acid, which is another antimicrobial compound inside the cell. So all of the compounds in the left column are antimicrobial and the compounds with a check mark undergo hydrolysis and release of the antimicrobial uh, constituent um, portion of the molecule, uh, which is lauric acid. Uh, DDG, which is um, that second compound is active um, in the original form, but cannot be hydrolyzed to lauric acid. Now here's an article um, from uh, PLOS uh, 2009. And what it basically says is that um, monolaurin was compared with DDG, which is a um, monoether, uh, compared for its effects on uh, Staphylococcus aureus growth uh, exotoxin production and stability. Mm -hmm. When the test was done in vitro, TVG was stable to staph aureus lipase and had higher inhibitory effect than monolaurin in vitro, so in the test tube. However, in vivo, monolaurin, monolaurin was more effective than DVG in reducing mortality and suppressing uh, TNF alpha and S aureus growth and endotoxin production. In other words, in vivo, monolaurin is more effective than DDG. So in the body, when you um, monolaurin would be more effective than DDG if you were to take that in as well. So lipase hydrolysis of coconut oil <clears throat> produces a cocktail of potentially active fatty acids and monoglycerides. And um, this mixture potentially provides a broader range of activity and synergistic activity. So for example, in this article by Wang in 1993, it was shown, if he reported that the mixture of monoacyl glycerols from coconut oil was more effective than monolaurin alone against um, uh, this bacteria, uh, Listeria monocytogenes. And certain combinations of, the, of this uh, monoacyl glycerols, particularly monocaprin and monolaurin, showed synergistic activity. In other words, when you ingest coconut oil, which is a mixture, and you get mixtures of monoacyl glycerols, the effect is better than just consuming monolaurin alone. Uh, in this um, next um, report, 
The activity of antimicrobial fatty acids and monoglycerides and their combinations against different bacteria are shown. Um, well, it's a, it's a pretty confusing slide, but basically it tells us that combinations of different, um, different combinations of these compounds, monocaprid, lauric acid, and monolaurin, are active against different types of um, bacteria. So it really shows that, you know, the <clears throat> There's a, a lot to be studied um, in terms of the monoacyl glycero, uh, glycerides as well as the fatty acids, which are released upon ingestion of uh, coconut oil. So let's go to um, the meat of this uh, presentation, uh, which is the uh, potential of coconut oil and its derivatives as effective and safe, safe antiviral agents against the novel coronavirus. So here I present two possible mechanisms um, based on scientific studies. The first one is disintegration of the viral membrane. This is hypothesized to occur outside the cell. So this is before the virus infects or enters the cell. And then the second mechanism is that um, uh, these compounds, uh, coconut compounds inhibit virus maturation. So this is hypothesized to occur inside the cell. So you have one mechanism that occurs outside the cell before infection, and a second mechanism which occurs inside the cell um, after the cell itself has been infected. So let's go to the uh, first mechanism, uh, disintegration of the viral membrane. So in the study by uh, here Holzer and Kabara, monolaurin reduced infectivity of 14 human RNA and DNA envelope viruses in cell cultures or in vitro by greater than 99.9%. Uh, monolaurin acted by disintegrating the virus envelope as shown for coronavirus. So the, the test substance was a coronavirus uh, 2293. So you have three uh, figures there, the control, the original, and then uh, one solution of monolaurin and the second solution of monolaurin. Um, but what's important here is that um, the solutions with monolaurin um, disintegrated the, uh, the um, vi viral membrane. Uh, in the same paper, um, they show that monolaurin reduced the infectivity of herpes, herpes simplex type 1 virus in a dose-dependent manner. High monolaurin concentration uh, resulted in low viral infectivity. In this paper, uh, Thormar and co-workers reported that medium-chain fatty acids, uh, mainly capric acid C10 and lauric acid C12, um, were active or were the most active against three envelope viruses. So those three envelope viruses were the vesicular stomatitis virus, herpes simplex virus type 1, and the Visna virus. Uh, antiviral fatty acids were found to destroy the viral envelope causing leakage and disintegration of the viral envelope at higher concentrations. So at low concentration, it was leakage, so not quite destroying the uh, membrane, but at high concentration, the virus membrane itself was um, destroyed. Mm -hmm. Now, um, this is um, sodium lauryl sulfate, which is actually um, a detergent. It's not a natural compound, it's produced uh, industrially. Um, actually, there are pharma-grade uh, SLS, and SLS is added as emulsifier in some uh, drugs. But anyway, in this study, which um, studied SLS, uh, which is a, actually a powerful surfactant, um, it solubilized and denatured the viral envelope inside the infected cell. Um, well, for the non-chemist, maybe this is your uh, surfactant 101 course. Um, a surfactant usually has a polar head group and a non-polar tail. So if you see the structures of um, lauric acid C12, monolaurin, and SLS, they all have a non-polar tail and a polar head group. <coughs> me. But the uh, polarity of the head group varies as you go from C12 to monolaurin to SLS. So they don't, they don't behave identically, but they have surfactant properties. 
Um, then in the middle, you have the lipid bilayer uh, structure uh, where you have these phospholipids make up the uh, virus membrane. And when you add surfactants, it can uh, disrupt or destroy the lipid bilayer. So that is the basic mechanism or what happens when you add surfactant to a lipid bilayer. So, well, we know all told that soap kills the virus by destroying the lipid membrane. Uh, in a way, the mechanisms are analogous, although of course you don't link soap, uh, but the mechanism of membrane destruction is uh, similar for coconut oil as well as soap. So compounds from coconut oil, which are formed upon ingestion, such as monolarin, kill the virus by destroying the lipid membrane. And likewise, when we wash our hands with soap, we're also killing the uh, virus by destroying its lipid membrane. So there, that's the basically the, the quick summary mechanism of how uh, coconut oil uh, destroys the, uh, the lipid membrane of the virus. So let's go to the uh, second mechanism. Um, inhibition of the virus maturation. So these uh, processes occur inside the cell. Uh, in this article um, by Horno, um, lauric acid inhibits maturation of vesicular stomatitis virus. Uh, VSV or vesicular stomatitis virus as a, as a membrane envelope as well. Um, so in the presence of um, lauric acid, the production of uh, infectious VSV was inhibited in a dose-dependent manner. Those with shorter or longer chains were less effective or had no antiviral activity. Second, analysis of the antiviral mechanism of lauric acid revealed that the correct assembly of the virus components was disturbed. And lauric acid prevented the binding of the M protein to the host cell uh, membrane, where the protein plays an essential role in the virus assembly. Thus, treatment of VSV infected cells with lauric acid resulted in an inhibition of the virus, uh, virus release. Now, other fatty acids also um, uh, in the left plot, it shows that uh, lauric acid is the strongest inhibition for the replication of the uh, uh, vesicular stomatitis virus. It is interesting to note that other fatty acids also had activity, although these were weaker. Uh, this brings up an interesting question. Would the effects of all fatty acids combined, so when you release them to coconut oil, you have many fatty acids. Would the effects of all these fatty acids combined be additive or synergistic? Now on the right plot, uh, cells were infected with the virus, the VSV, and incubated in the presence, uh, those are the um, diamond, um, diamond uh, in the figure, uh, in the absence in the diamond uh, or presence of um, uh, lauric acid. Now, after 16 hours uh, of lauric acid treatment, a portion was withdrawn and grown with um, lauric acid free medium. So, here you can see that lauric acid inhibited the virus replication. However, this effect is reversible and the virus will replicate when lauric acid is withdrawn from the uh, solution. The implication here is that one must have a steady concentration of lauric acid um, for this uh, effect to work. Uh, in this article by uh, Bartolata, again, um, he says uh, uh, saturated fatty acids, that C10 to C18, were evaluated for the inhibitory activity against the Junin virus. The most active inhibitor was lauric acid, which reduced uh, virus yields of the pathogenic strains in a dose-dependent manner uh, without affecting the viability of the cell. Uh, fatty acids with shorter or longer chain lengths had a reduced or negligible antiviral activity. From the mechanistic studies, it was, um, uh, it was, um, concluded that um, uh, 
lauric acid induced effects which were dependent on the continued presence of the fatty acid. And this is consistent with the uh, results of uh, Hornung, Hornung's previous work. Uh, still from Bartolata, um, these images show how uh, lauric acid interfered with expression and distribution of the uh, uh, Junin virus proteins, inhibiting viral replication. So on the um, left side, you have the control at zero hours and then um, the bottom control at 24 hours. So the virus is growing, uh, cells are growing healthy with the virus. However, when you put in um, lauric acid, uh, after 24 hours, the, um, the viral replication is um, inhibited. So um, here's a summary of the possible mechanisms by which compounds formed um, by lipase hydrolysis of coconut oil are active. So as you said earlier, this in integrates the viral membrane. Lauric acid and monolaurin, which are formed upon ingestion of coconut oil, as well as uh, sodium lauryl sulfate, a synthetic um, C12 surfactant, kill viruses by disintegration of the viral membrane. And secondly, inhibition of virus maturation. Lauric acid can inhibit virus maturation in a dose-dependent and reversible manner. Now, interestingly, VCO can be taken safely in a number of ways. And you can use this to target the organs where the ACE2 receptors are present. So it's actually very um, flexible. Um, the big advantage with VCO is that you can take it orally, so you can drink it. You can gargle it to clean out your throat. Uh, you can do oil pulling to clean out your mouth. Um, you can also sp spray it into your nose, um, so nasal spray. And some people also use put uh, VCO as eye drops. So since um, this virus appears to enter the body through many uh, channels, uh, this is an interesting um, way of applying uh, VCO. So here's a closing section of our paper with um, Dr. Newport. Uh, given the considerable scientific evidence for the antiviral activity of coconut oil, lauric acid and its derivatives and their general safety, and the absence of a cure for, uh, for the virus, we urge that clinical studies be conducted among patients who have been infected with this virus. And this treatment is affordable and virtually risk-free and the potential benefits are enormous. Of course, what we've shown in this presentation is that coconut oil is antiviral. However, we still have to determine its efficacy against COVID-19 itself as therapy or as prophylaxis. In particular, we have to determine the dosage and most effective modes of uh, intake. So this is what we have to do. Um, this is a picture of uh, our group uh, <clears throat> in our uh, DOC funded project. So we are doing the in vitro study on the efficacy of lauric acid and derivatives against uh, COVID-19. Uh, these studies are, in vitro studies are being done at uh, Duke and US in uh, Singapore. And um, well, the acknowledgements, we, we were able to get <clears throat> we ourselves from Dr. Sonia Sinto of um, UP Deliman, uh, and physical biology. And NMR studies were run by our research assistant. So our um, other co-workers are Dr. Dinson, uh, Dr. Enriquez, and Dr. Lopez, and their respective assistants. Now, other studies are also uh, in the offing. There's one, um, uh, potential benefits of VCO among suspected and probable cases of COVID-19 um, being uh, done by FNRI. Uh, that's a food and nutrition research institute, also funded by uh, PCHRD in cooperation with the uh, Philippine Coconut Authority. And a pending study, uh, VCO as, uh, as uh, adjunctive uh, therapy for COVID-19 patients. And uh, we plan to do some work with the international coconut community. So finally, the last section, how can they survive COVID-19 and what does coconuts have to do with surviving COVID-19? 
Well, first of all, we have to realize that um, surviving to survive COVID-19, um, the solutions have to be effective, affordable, and appropriate. Uh, COVID-19 is a, a global pandemic affecting different countries of different you know, needs, uh, social, socioeconomic status, et cetera. So the solutions have to be um, appropriate for all of them. Um, so there's no one size fits all in terms of um, uh, solutions. In order to survive COVID-19, many groups have been scouring the medicine cabinet for possible repurposed drugs and vaccines. Um, so here's a list of some of the repurposed drugs, um, you know, including chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, remdesivir, uh, sildenafil, which is actually Viagra and other um, antiviral compounds, as well as uh, a vaccine with, for, against tuberculosis, which um, is being tried. Um, so right now we still don't have no good treatments uh, at the present time. Now, um, a little note about remdesivir. Um, if you look at the structure, it's really very um, quite complicated. Um, the synthesis of remdesivir is a scientific triumph, but it may not be a practical uh, global solution. Uh, remdesivir was already developed uh, for Ebola and it's being considered as a repurposed drug. Um, it decreased COVID-19 hospital recovery time from 15 days to 11 days. So it's not really antiviral, but it helps with the recovery. Uh, Gilead, which is the um, manufacturer, says it may take six to eight months to optimize the chemical synthesis process. Uh, the chemical synthesis that was patented is shown on the right. It's uh, quite complicated. And the availability and cost are still uh, to be determined. In order to survive COVID-19, we need to we need appropriate solutions for the bottom of the pyramid. So the uh, people who are least able to cope with this uh, pandemic um, need solutions which are appropriate for them. So in order to survive COVID-19, we need to find our own solutions. As I said earlier, there's really no one size fits all. A solution, but there's a menu of things that we can do. Of course, there are the behavioral things which everyone should do, physical distancing, wearing face masks, frequent hand washing, disinfection. Um, the work on antibodies is still ongoing. Um, if you've been infected, then you may have antibodies against the uh, virus. Uh, people are studying convalescent serum. Uh, monoclonal antibodies and vaccines are still under development. Uh, for therapeutics, uh, People look at repurposed drugs and these are still <clears throat> uh, ongoing. Um, there are many that are considering and have reported on the successes of traditional medicine, Ayurveda and uh, traditional Chinese medicine, and of course, PCO. Now, the other thing which has not really been given enough attention is how we should strengthen our immune system, which means uh, intake of vitamins, especially vitamin C and D, uh, zinc, selenium, improving our diet and nutrition, improving lifestyle, uh, exercise, uh, traditional uh, medicine, again, and PCO. And of course, the other measures, uh, diagnostics, testing, contract uh, tracing, etc. cetera. Um, but one thing which I didn't really cover in this lecture is that, um, and people have mentioned it, is that we have to reconsider uh, the way we've been developing. And when we talk about health, we really talk about health of all humans as well as health of the environment. So finally, in order to survive COVID-19, we need to grow coconuts. Uh, coconuts support farmers. So this addresses poverty and the bottom of the pyramid. Coconut trees are environmentally friendly. Uh, coconuts can be intercropped with other crops. So this addresses some food security as well as income. Coconuts can be directly consumed as nourishing food, <clears throat> improving nutrition. Coconuts can be processed into numerous food products. Uh, coconuts can be processed also into numerous industrial products, such as oleochemicals, building materials, fibers, uh, nanocarbon. So truly, coconut, the coconut tree is uh, truly the tree of life. So I hope that the VCO can provide a safe, effective, inexpensive, and readily available supplement to combat uh, COVID-19. 
And if it does, this will be a game changer. So finally, in closing, um, during this time of COVID, let us keep calm and go coconuts. So thank you for your attention. All right. So thank you very much, Dr. Dairi, for your uh, very comprehensive uh, presentation. Um, I'm sure we have uh, gained a lot of knowledge okay, from your uh, talk. All right, so before we proceed to the question and answer portion, for those who are new in attending webinar here in Zoom, so uh, here's how you can uh, uh, relate to us your questions. Um, oh, well, so at the panel below, you'll see uh, a chat box and a QA uh, uh, section. So you can post your questions at the uh, Q&A uh, um, panel okay, uh, below the, or at the bottom part of, the, of your screen. Or you can also raise your hand at the participants panel and then uh, wait for us to uh, acknowledge you. Uh, please state your name and affiliation. Thank you. So we'll first uh, look into some questions posted in our um, chat box. All right. So uh, the question, uh, this, is, this was the very first question posted by uh, Dr. Concepcion Lizada from uh, UP Diliman. So uh, does intake of VCO lead to increase in laurate or lauric acid derivatives in the serum? How fast is this process? Do they get transported to mucous membrane? Well, that's a very question. Um, it's quite detailed. Um, in humans, I don't think it's been studied. So we should put that on the uh, wish list of things to do. So uh, I'm sure Dr. Lizardo will be very interested to, uh, to uh, participate in that study. But right now, I don't have um, you know, detail. And also, you have to consider the condition of the person uh, taking it, whether you're fasted or you're not fasted. It, it, it changed the uh, the amount of lauric acid that you would have in your system. All right. Um, next question. Well, from Willie Sentinta. Hi, Dr. Dairi. Uh, it is said that uh, coconut oil contains 92% saturated fats, which at excess amounts may raise LDL. In the midst of this pandemic, majority of casualties are our senior populace that are highly vulnerable due to declining immune capabilities. In view of that, if ever approved, is BCO safe to take by our senior citizens currently battling the virus? How about for those with anaphylactic reactions to BCO? Sir? Well, first I'm not too sure about anaphylactic reactions. Of course, if, you're, if you have a reaction to anything, then of course you should avoid it. But to answer the question about the 99% saturated fat, um, it's 65% medium chain fatty acids. So these are um, metabolized much more quickly than, than the long chain fatty acids, is the first one, first um, short answer. Uh, the second short answer is that um, it raises LDL, but also raises the HDL uh, at the same time. So what's important really is that the ratio of um, LDL to HDL. And um, from the studies I've seen, the ratio is not, is still healthy, even if the, basically the total cholesterol will increase, but both the LDL and HDL mm -hmm. will increase. And the um, parameters are, are still within, uh, very much within the, the healthy range. And then maybe the third uh, answer I would like to um, give is that uh, naturally as people age and this has been known since the 1950s uh, total cholesterol really increases naturally in healthy people um, this is known in 1955 that they took um, blood samples of people from different ages and um, the range the total cholesterol of 200 which is set at the standard is really the um, range for someone who's 20 years old 
and as you get older, that 200 is going to increase naturally, uh, even if you're healthy. So the 200 is really an artificial standard because it's not related. Um, it's given as an absolute level, when in fact, your total cholesterol should be adjusted to your age. Uh, it's the same thing as many other indicators. As you age, you change the, um, the standard for you know, health indicators. Um, so this is a, um, an imposed standard, which I think is, um, well, it's not healthy because it's, it's not appropriate for older people. All right. So another uh, question from the uh, question and answer panel from Antoinette Marcella. Is there a difference in the efficacy in different varieties of coconuts? Oh, well, oh, that's the net. Yes, I, um, as far as I know, there's, it's, <clears throat> um, there, there, there are several varieties of uh, coconut. The most common is the Laguna Tol. And uh, we have not really seen any <clears throat> difference. It's really what the fatty acid profile is. And um, the usual fatty acid profile that's measured is um, the fatty acid um, content at 12 months or the mature uh, coconut. Mm -hmm. So as far as I know, um, regardless of what type of coconut it is, it should be okay. All right. So uh, let's, uh, at this time, let's entertain some live questions from those who raised their hands. So may we uh, hear from Dr. Gladys Completo? Dr. Completo? Unmute na. Ayan. Dr. Completo? Oh, maybe his line is not working. Okay, let's hello. hear from... Uh, yeah, hello? Yeah, yes. yes. Hello, ma'am. You may good ask morning, a question. Dr. Yes. Hi, good, good morning, morning Dr. Ma. David. Thank you very much for that um, wonderful and very informative seminar. So my question is, um, you mentioned in your... Um, um, just in the introductory part about the DBG, where they had a comparison, they compared ah, yes, with yes. Um, um, monolorin. monolorin. I just yes, noticed yes. in I noticed in the structure, um, and yes. it's not that effective. And I noticed in the structure, and um, correct me if I'm wrong, that is actually an alcohol. Maybe that's the ah, yes, reason it? why. Maybe that's yeah, the reason why it's not um, effective. Yes, it, because... Well, it's an ether, so the ether. Yeah, it's an, the ether will not be hydrolyzed by lipase. Yeah. So it's, yeah. Uh, it's uh, inert as a, in terms of uh, hydrolysis. So it will act as the entire compound, uh, DDS, as a, but it will not be hydrolyzed to produce uh, lauric acid. So I think that's the, the big difference between monolaurin, mm -hmm. which can be hydrolyzed and hydrolyzed lauric acid or laurate. Yes, maybe. Yeah, that's why. So um, yes. um, did they actually try something that's commercially available with that? Uh, I'm with, not with sure. I'll, I'll, um, I'll have to look at the details of the article again, but uh, I just point out the, the, because they're so similar in structure, uh, the difference between you know, one is an ether, the other is an ester. Oh, okay. um, so it just brings out the importance, the um, dual nature of monolaurin that by itself it's active, but then you hydrolyze it and there's still something active. Um, yes, thank you. I have okay, another question Yes. about your about the second function that you mentioned that um, it inhibits the virus maturation. Yes. And then you mentioned this actually from, uh, my question is about the paper. Um, if you um, can remember, the details of the paper because in, in mentioned in the slide that it actually diminishes the glycoprotein synthesis. So I'm thinking is this the spike protein that's um, being um, prevented. So can you elaborate on that, how they came up with that uh, conclusion? Uh, well, I, I think the, the papers actually give quite detailed, they do, they have this um, SDS page um, profiles uh, showing which proteins are being produced. And so they show that um, 
the proteins may be produced, but then they're being produced in lower amounts. Um, so I guess it's the, the evidence that they got from various studies. Uh, they could show that the virus still, I guess, moves along because it, it, it will get released by the cell, but it's inhibited. So you have a lower uh, virus release. And the hypothesis is that the um, assembly of the virus um, going out, um, going back out of the cell is uh, inhibited, so it slows down. So it's not a complete um, destruction of the virus inside, uh, but it just inhibits it. Yes, because that's very interesting because right, they, they're, um, they're trying to claim that there's a glycan shield, right, surrounding the virus. And that's why our immune yeah. system cannot detect it. So, um, so that's why I'm more. I'm actually interested in that. How how mm -hmm. did it, um, the mechanism about it? Because it would be interesting to know really the details of the glycopotomics of that virus. Yeah. Well, uh, actually, I should note that those studies were done in other viruses. So, for COVID, for for SARS-CoV-2, um, those specific studies have not been done yet. So, it's actually going to be a good study, but sort of hard to do it on. SARS-CoV-2 because it's so infective. Um, but those are studies on other viruses. And so it's really just um, suggestion that perhaps these same mechanisms also operate in uh, SARS-CoV-2 because you know the viruses would have analogous um, pathways that they follow. So yeah, I, I think the, the main point here is that um, coconut oil and its uh, metabolites have been shown to be antiviral. Um, the question is, is it anti-SARS-CoV-2? And will it, you know, is it good against COVID-19? Um, so that, those are the questions we need to answer. Uh, the big advantage with BCO is that there's really very little um, toxicity to think of. Uh, the worst you would have is a uh, upset stomach. Um, so, yeah, it's 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 not a very um, toxic study, um, mm -hmm. uh, to put it that way. Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah, thank you also for the question. Thank you, Doctor Completo. Uh, let's hear from a uh, a colleague from the United States, Doctor Bunkin, Jeffrey Bunkin. Uh, hello. Hello. Hi. Yes, Hi, sir. Hello. Hi, Dr. Derek. Thank you so much for the talk. So I was actually just quite curious about um, your mention of VGO being cheap and uh, uh, essentially affordable. Um, could you make a comment on that? Is VGO really cheap? Um, because I think like if you're going to compare it with uh, other synthetic uh, C12 um, surfactant molecules that you could get at fairly high purity, um, VGO is likely more expensive. Ah, well, uh, of course, I, I don't know how much VCO would cost in, in the U.S. Um, quite a lot of that's really marketing and stuff. But I, I guess that would apply to the coconut producing uh, regions. So, um, well, here, VCO, um, one liter is about 300, 400 pesos. So that, that's fairly affordable. But actually, the other thing is um, you don't have to take VCO. You can just <laughs> eat your coconuts. Um, the uh, one nut, I think, is um, I, I'm trying to recall uh, about 50 ml of uh, coconut oil would be present in one nut. So if you cook your food using, you know, with coconut, milk, you'll be ingesting coconut oil. So of course, VCO is a product, but then having a coconut-based diet, which includes, uh, in our case, in the Philippines, it would be kata. But then many countries have their own versions of uh, <clears throat> coconut diets. Um, curries are coconut based. So you can take it in your diet. Of course, you can't measure it um, you know, medically, but um, you, you can ingest uh, coconut oil by uh, cooking with um, coconut. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Right. Thank you, sir. Um, another question from Ms. Cecilia Wangit. Hi, ma'am. Mm. 
Miss Cecilia, are you there? Oh, perhaps his uh, her connection is not uh, working right now. Let's uh, look first at the question for from uh, Mr. Omar Tiwana. Mr. Omar Tiwana. <laughs> All right. So let's look first at questions from the from the Q and A panel. All right. So from a uh, well from an anonymous attendee, since SARS-CoV-2 primarily infects and replicates in the respiratory tract, how does ingestion of coconut oil result in delivery of these fatty acids or derivatives to the respiratory epithelia? in concentrations sufficient to display antiviral activity by membrane surfactant action? Uh, well, that's a very good question, but I think that's a um, clinical research question. Um, as I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> you can actually um, spray um, VCO uh, nasally um, mm -hmm. taking it orally. So there are a number of experiments that can actually um, be done. Um, but I don't have the answer to that question because we don't have any data on that. Um, but you know, in, in theory, it could happen. It could work. Um, of course, it depends on what the viral load is as well. So th there are many questions that need to be um, uh, answered um, with, you know, to, to, for that question. All right. So uh, do we have now Mr. Omar Tiwana? Mr. Omar. Hi, it, can you hear me? Yes, yes, sir. Are you yes, sir. Uh, hi, Professor Toby. How are you doing? Hi. Hi. Thanks. Good evening. Thanks. Uh, thanks for a fantastic uh, presentation, especially for non scientists and non doctors like me. Very clear. My question, uh, Dr. Toby, is this You mentioned that uh, there should be clinical trials. I was wondering that, you know, with the body of information that you've summarized, uh, are there clinical trials ongoing? And if they are, uh, are you aware of what the results have been? And uh, if there are no clinical trials going, or if they're only marginal, why would that be given the type of empirical data you provided on the efficacy of coconuts and coconut oil? Well, that is a, a very good question. Um, well, at least in the Philippines, there's already <clears throat> one uh, leading study that's already been done. It's more of a dietary intervention of uh, BCO versus uh, control. Um, there's still one study pending in a hospital setting on COVID patients. And um, with the, through the international coconut community, we're trying to put together a, a proposal um, on, on studying um, you know, the, the use of BCO uh, against COVID-19. So I guess to maybe the short answer to your question is that um, it's a, an approach, it's not a drug, it's really a nutritional supplement. And I think um, it's probably the awareness of people are not, or especially uh, medical practitioners are not aware that a nutritional supplement might work against uh, COVID-19. So well, hopefully um, we'll be able to get the uh, word out um, give the evidence that this is worth uh, studying, and that there will be uh, medical doctors who, who will pick it up. So I'm not a medical doctor, so um, I really can't run uh, clinical studies, but I can advise uh, people on, on what things to do. So, but anyway, thank you for your question. Hopefully, if there are um, physicians who are listening, um, they can think about, you know, giving it. Um, yeah, I'm looking into it. So thank you for your question. Thanks. Uh, 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 Mr. Joseph, could I ask one follow-up question to that? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Hi, uh, 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 Professor Toby, one follow-up. In terms of the studies that you're aware of uh, uh, for the use of virgin coconut oil as a nutritional supplement, have you seen any uh, data or, or information about how long you need to Take this, uh, take uh, you know, have coconut in your diet, or take uh, you know, use coconut oil in different ways uh, over time to see the efficacy of the, the 
that, 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 that type of a diet. In other words, is it probably one year, two years, two months, or, you know, depending of course on the, on the quantum of coconuts that you have in your system. Any, any thoughts on that? Uh, well, actually that, that's an excellent question. Um, I think if in terms of uh, <clears throat> bringing coconut um, fatty acids into your system, the effect is immediate, um, but the body still has to adjust. So in fact, if you notice, if you're not used to coconut, the first thing you might feel is that you have an upset stomach, which really means that um, your uh, body system, your, your stomach microbiota is not used to coconut, coconut oil. But after a few days, uh, <clears throat> that, that will get resolved and you feel comfortable again. So um, you have the short-term effect of you know, producing the fatty acids. Um, the longer-term effect is your body adjusting to it. Now, the other aspect which I did not cover is that um, coconut also has, and there have been publications, um, immunomodulating properties, um, which I think will go to your, your uh, question about what is the long-term effect of taking uh, coconut oil. Um, now, that I think needs to be uh, studied. And um, yeah, uh, no answers to that yet, but certainly um, that is a a question which is uh, very um, interesting and important. So thank you for that question. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Mr. Omar. Uh, do we have now Mr. Uh, Miss Cecilia? Miss Cecilia, are you there? Hi. Yeah. Okay. Please uh, go ahead with your question. Miss Cecilia. Yeah, hello. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah. Miss Cecilia. Yeah, okay. uh, thank yes. you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, even though I have um, wrote it in setting, uh, my question is uh, about um, in what condition this uh, physio can killing the virus or it's just for just for protection or that's what's my question but in what condition thank you oh uh, yes I, I think your question is whether vco can be taken as a protection meaning as a prophylactic yeah and second uh, as cure so you're already sick and whether <clears throat> Uh, you can take uh, VCO. Uh, my answer to that is I think you can take it uh, both ways. Um, as a prophylactic, you should take uh, a baseline of um, coconut oil consumption. And uh, there's no evidence for it yet for its efficacy. But the usual um, recommendation is three tablespoons per day or one tablespoon after every meal. Um, so you have some level of um of uh you know coconut oil uh, compounds in your body and um <clears throat> when you get if you're actually sick then the usual recommendation is to uh have nine tablespoons a day or three times um three tablespoons uh three times a day but those are sort of um estimates so the actual um uh, recommendation, which which is a basis in a clinical study, is still not available. Uh, so what we have now are <clears throat> a sort of um, um, standard. Um, <clears throat> I call them the estimates. So okay, I hope that answers your question. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, All right. thank you, thank you. Uh, we can perhaps entertain two more questions. There are actually about 70 questions in the Q&A panel and uh, a number are also, a number is also uh, raising their hands, but uh, I think we have some uh, time constraints right now. So we'll just be entertaining two more questions. Uh, this is coming from uh, Ma uh, Ms. Lilia Molina from Erie. Uh, great presentation and information, Dr. Dairit. Uh, just a question, if VCO is not accessible, 
Can BCO be replaced for its antiviral property by using coconut oil for usual cooking instead? Um, well, actually, yes. Um, in um, 1998, when BCO actually came into the market after the year 2000, in um, <clears throat> 1997, 98, <clears throat> my, my father ran a um, the first um, clinical. It was a small clinical study on. Um, using um, you know, using cooking oil. Uh, this was the there were about thirty uh, HIV patients. The study was done in San Lazaro Hospital. Um, so uh, you can take uh, cooking oil. Um, I guess the thing there is it's not as maybe um, well in the absence of VCO, uh, cooking oil will will, um, will do since you're, you're after the the C12 uh, content. Um, so I guess that's the short answer. Um, it, it's possible right, to take uh, cooking oil. All right, sir. Okay, so one last question from a uh, live question from the audience coming from Miss Irma with Yasti. Miss Irma. Ms. Irma? Yes? Yes, go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. David. I want to ask about another potential of the coconut oil. Uh, we in Indonesia is trying to find is there any kind like phenolic compound that can use uh, to be a protease inhibitor. From your experience, uh, is there any chance we can do that? Or because uh, most of the data only shown the fatty acid, but not the phenolic acid. And yes, <clears throat> well, thank you for the question. It's a very good question. Um, aside from the uh, the fatty acids themselves, the VCO um, and this, but this would not be present in in um, cooking oil. Uh, VCO will have minor constituents, so to speak. Um, phytosterols. Um, the um, phenolics have not actually been looked at uh, in terms of their potential effect. So it is a, so I would consider that a good research question, um, whether phenolics, and, and here I would um, use, phenol, I would put phenolics in the presence of BCO. So not just phenolics alone. Um, but the combination of phenolics in VCO and whether this has a beneficial effect. Um, so the short answer to your question is that this study has not been done uh, in terms of antiviral properties, um, but I think it's a very good um, research topic. So congratulations for, uh, I hope so, someone can, um, can pursue this question. So it, it, it's a good, good topic to do. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. David. Thank you, thank you. All right. So, thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot anymore entertain. Uh, there are about 75 more questions in the Q&A panel. But uh, for those who want to relay their questions to Dr. David, sir, do you have uh, a contact email address so they can perhaps send you an email? Uh, yes, yes, of course. Uh, they can email me at... Um, uh, F, oh well, um, maybe you can post it uh, on your Facebook. It's F. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. F D A Y R I T at mm -hmm. Ateneo dot edu. All right, sir. So we'll have it uh, posted in our Facebook page so they can uh, contact you for their uh, questions. Right? Yes, sir. Thank so, you. Um, once again, we wish to uh, relay our sincerest thanks to Dr. Dairit for um, uh, being with us this morning uh, to deliver his talk on uh, the potential of coconut oil as uh, potential uh, antiviral agents for the novel co coronavirus. Uh, before we end, I would just like to acknowledge um, the presence of our 380 participants and those who are streaming uh, via YouTube. So thank you very much for attending. Uh, based from my uh, browsing in the chat box, 
We have attendees from Zamboanga, Pampanga, Nueva Ecija, Baguio City, Catanduanes, Bukidnon, Tarlac, Cavite, Batangas, and Surigao. And we also have uh, listeners from abroad, from the United Arab Emirates, Indonesia, from Massachusetts, USA, New York, and from Tokyo. So thank you very much for being with us oh, uh, this morning. Well, yeah. thank you to all the participants. Um, Yes, sir. So uh, for those who are not able to uh, listen fully to the webinar, so Dr. Dairit has allowed us to post the recording of the uh, webinar in the official page of Kapisanang Kimika ng Pilipinas, Southern Tagalog, so, so that you can view it again. All right, so we'll have that posted uh, perhaps later this afternoon. All right. So I, uh, be, uh, before we end, I wish to uh, acknowledge again, Dr. Dairit, thank you very much for your time. You're welcome. Uh, yes. And we also want to uh, acknowledge the UPLB Information Technology Center for uh, helping us hosting this uh, webinar. Thank you to the ITC UPLB staff and uh, to our co-host uh, for this webinar, the Institute of Chemistry, UPLB, headed by the director, uh, Dr. Maribik Laksamana. So thank you very much for attending and uh, we wish everyone a good day and keep extra safe always. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and, and go coconuts. Go coconuts. <laughs> All right. Okay, thank you.